Hey guys, Mike from Magnanimous here, and we're back live from Studio One for another build of the day. You guys will notice we're a bit wider today than we typically are, and that's because today we're going to be talking about how to build out our Kessler Pocket Jib here for a top-down uh, setup to shoot, whether it be a tabletop top-down or uh, similar to what we had talked about the other day with the Dana Dolly, if you wanted to do clothing or uh, poster prints, blow-ups, things like that, great for all of those. To enhance that the best we can, for our camera today, we're going to be pairing with the Panasonic EVA-1. If you're unfamiliar with the Panasonic EVA-1, it's kind of the younger brother to the Panasonic Vericam LT. It features a uh, 5.6K sensor in the front, capable of rendering high-quality 4K, and it also packs a punch for high speed as well. Features dual native internal ISO, so you have uh, photo sites for rendering at 800 ISO, or a 2500 ISO for low light or uh, high speed, things that need a little bit more sensitivity in your sensor. The biggest plus and benefit from this really is the 5.6K sensor because it's downscaling that for higher quality 4K and it is actually gonna render a sharper image than what you'll find in competing Super 35 censored cameras like the FS5, C200, things like that. Because of that, it's going to be really, really good for our top-down setup today because we're going to be able to make out as much detail as we possibly can. We had the benefit of taking these guys out for a test run uh, when we did a mini-doc about Cynthia Berg, who is a painter. So if you guys haven't seen that, check that out. That was shot on the Panasonic EVA-1, and we paired CP2 lenses with it, which is what we're using today. Today we'll be using the Zeiss CP2 50mm macro, which is a 2.1 macro, uh, f2.1 macro lens. So you're still going to get some really nice shallow depth of field, but we have a really, really close focus. So for top-down stuff, we can get our lens extremely close to our subject and still be in uh, focus. I found the working distance to be about six inches or so from the front of the lens. So you do get a lot, a lot of working distance with this. So it's really good for the top down. And uh, yeah, as always, if you have questions while we're going through this build, comment below. We'll answer those at the end of the video. And then if there's stuff that you guys want to see, comment below and let me know. Tomorrow's build is actually going to be something that was requested last week. So definitely let us know if there's stuff that you want to see. And we'll highlight those down the road in future videos. Uh, for our jib setup today, I went ahead and pre-built some of it, just so you guys didn't have to see me futzing with the heavy pieces trying to fit it all together. But if you haven't worked with the Kessler Pocket Jib before, it breaks down into two main sections. You'll have your K-pod down here, which is the tripod that it all mounts to, and then you have the actual jib armature on the top. I can loosen this knob here and actually pull this up so you guys can see. And if I loosen the two thumb knobs in the center here, I'll turn so you can see those. This whole piece lifts out, and that allows it to com compress down to a much smaller size, so it's easier to tra transport and travel with, but setup can actually still be very quick because you don't have a lot of fitting to do. You just pop this guy down on the K-Pod, tighten it down. Everything can raise up if you need to to give you more height, and these arms here extend even farther. You just loosen the thumb knob here, and it will slide to compress or extend farther. We're running about three quarters of the way out today just to maximize the amount of strength in our arm. It'll have a 40 pound weight capacity when it's all collapsed, but when you extend your arm all the way out, it does get reduced down to a 20 pound capacity. So I wanted to find a middle ground. We could extend it all the way, but we're limited in space in the studio, and I want you guys to see everything as I'm putting it all together. So we're gonna run it uh, at this distance here. So to start, when you're setting up, you just want to first check to make sure that all of your thumb knobs are tightened all the way down. And then I'm going to start by getting a ball mount ready for our top here. The reason we're using a ball mount is for the 90 degree rotation, because if I've just mounted a camera on here, I'm just going to be looking forward and I wouldn't be able to point it straight down. So we have an adapter here that's going to slot on. It has three positions that you can slot it in to change the distance that you'll have. Because we have a little bit of a beefy setup today, it's not huge, but it's heavy enough. I'm going to run it in the 
uh, shortest path just to limit the amount of torque it's putting on this screw here. If you wanted to get further distance, you certainly could run it farther out. One thing you'll notice as we're working is as I add weight to either end, the jib is going to want to move in that particular direction. And that's because I've added weight and essentially our balance, as if it was a teeter-totter, has been skewed. Part of balancing and setting up a jib is to equalize the weight by adding weights to the back of the jib. We're going to do that much later in, though, and I'm going to walk you guys through my process for setting all this up. Once we've got this on, we'll go ahead and throw on our bowl. This is compatible with 100 millimeter or 75 millimeter bowls. I have a 100 millimeter on now. If we needed to, there's just a small adapter ring. We could pop this in, and now it's compatible with 75. We're going to be using the Sattler V20 tripod head today, so we'll use our 100 millimeter. I already have it turned in a 90 degree rotation for us, but one thing I did want to show you guys, and I'll turn it so you can get a good close up here, is that in order to do it in 90 degree rotation, you need to scoot your head back so it's at the 10 right there. Uh, because if I were to turn this forward, you'll notice that my pan lock knob there sits just below that. If I were to run my plate any farther down, it would impede our ability to lock our pan. It's not a huge issue. It just means that we have to make sure that we set that before we attach anything to ensure that we maintain that 90 degree rotation. I'm just going to remove our claw ball knob here, and it's going to mount down onto this bowl mount just like you would a tripod. I am going to preemptively loosen this, though, because I don't want to wear out the locks on my jib. And as soon as I add more weight, it's going to want to fall like that. So I'm going to go ahead and let it just go down as far as it'll go. I'm purposely adding weight with a leg forward. That ensures that the jib isn't going to tip as I add weight. If I were, here, I'll show you. If I were to run this instead with my weight over the empty space here, all of that weight's going to want to pull the jib this direction. To, so to ensure that we have a stable jib set up, we're going to make sure that we build up with that weight along the leg, which prevents it from tilting in that direction. We'll go ahead and lock all this back down. And then it's just a matter of attaching our tripod head. Now, for today's build, I have chosen to build up on a hi-hat. And that's just so that I don't have to take the camera off the tripod head, then mount the tripod head to my jib, and then mount my camera back to it. It's going to expedite that process a bit. Not that you couldn't do it with only one tripod head, but I do encourage you to have one to build up on, and then one for the jib itself. It's just going to make your life a little bit easier, swapping between those, and building and changing the setup for camera. I've gone ahead and balanced my head so that it's perfectly vertical with my ball level in the back. And I'm going to go ahead and just orientate it so that it's right in front. And then I'll do the same thing in the back. I'll loosen the claw ball knob and balance here. It's already good in balance, so we're good to go there. But if it wasn't, we'd want to preemptively do that before we added weight to this. Now this is as far as we can go with the jib, because before I add weights to it, I want to know how much weight I need to counterbalance, so we'll get camera attached. So we'll go ahead and just lock everything down, and we'll pop over to our hi-hat to go ahead and start building up our camera. The core of our build today is going to be the Red Rock Quick Release System. We've talked about this quick release system a lot, but it's just a really good universal quick release that allows us to customize our camera height versus our rod height. In this case, I've purposely raised my camera a little bit to enable a pass-through rod, which is going to allow us to mount a gold mount battery in the back to power a follow focus, as well as mount a lens motor in the front for that follow focus to uh, control. So we'll start by just putting our tripod plate on. I'm purposely going to run this as far back on the quick release as I can, just to help with how everything's going to balance out. And I'll go ahead and tighten him down. We can go ahead and pop him on. Now, the benefit of today's build is I'm using two V20 heads. So when I go to mount my camera over to the jib, all I have to do is remove it here 
and pop it on. I don't have to mess with the plate or anything like that. Just helps expedite your builds and everything. And then we'll go ahead and run our rails. We can fine tune the exact placement of these. We're just looking for a kind of general positioning there. And we'll connect our Panasonic EVA 1 to our quick release on there. For those of you who don't know, the Panasonic EVA 1 does come with a native EF mount, making it compatible with all Canon lenses. And it does have smart contacts there that you'll see. So you'll be able to use autofocus lenses as well. I've just found that the Panasonic's uh, autofocus is not super reliable and fairly clunky. So we're going to instead pair it with the Zeiss CP2 and run the SXU wireless follow focus for our focus control. You could very easily replace the camera with a C200 or a C500 Mark II or even the FX9, any camera that has more powerful autofocus and utilize that. But for our purposes today, we want the utmost amount of control over how our image is going to look. I found that the Zeiss CP2s play really, really well into Panasonic's color science. The V-Log has always kind of tended to end a little magenta, and CP2s play more into the cooler color ranges. So I found that those pair really, really well together. It's why we chose to shoot the uh, mini dock with those. Uh, so I think this pairing is going to be really good for our setup for today. I am going to purposely mount our camera so it's as far forward to our rails as possible. That's going to ensure that the focus gears sit in a good position that our motor is going to be able to mount to. And we can go ahead and lock him down in place. Then we have a battery bracket here. This is a gold mount battery mount that's going to attach a gold mount brick to our rails. I've purposely ran it in a horizontal orientation to ensure that I have full access to my I.O. ports on the back of the EVA 1. You could run it vertical if you needed, but I just have found that running like this makes plugging SDIs, things like that, a little bit more cumbersome. So we're going to run it horizontal. And then we can go ahead and mount our lens on the front. The really nice benefit about the Zeiss CP2s is that they are interchangeable lens mounts. So we can run them in PL or EF based on whichever camera you're using. So they're very, very flexible. And they are very sharp as well, which will play really well into the already sharp image that we're pulling from the 5.7K sensor of the EVA 1. With that, now we just need to hook up our follow focus. We've talked a lot about the RE follow focus systems that we have, but in case you're new to them, the SXU and the REWCU4 both use these REC force motors that have an integrated antenna and uh, is a transceiver, meaning it can send and receive signals, meaning you don't need any extra box or anything like that to do your processing. The motor handles all of that. And so all we'll need to do is mount a motor and run a single cable for power, and we'll be ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and attach this up on the side. It'll fit onto 19 mil or 15 mil rods, either one. We just generally use 15 mil because they're a lot lighter weight and for most setups are sufficient to support the weight needed. But they are very adaptable based on your specific setup. Great, once our motor's in place, all we'll need to do is run power. Now, since we are running the brick bat on the back, I wanted to go ahead and power camera off of it as well. So I have a multi-tap splitter here. Uh, it just takes one P-tap and converts it into four, so we can power multiple devices off of it. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug that into our plate now. And then we'll have our four pin to P-tap cable for the SXU and its motor. And that just plugs into the LBUS connector on the motor. And we'll run that back. And I'm just going to do a slight cabling around my rods to help manage the cable. And we'll plug that in. 
especially since we're going to be picking up the system and moving it, it's very important that we keep our cables very nicely, snugly compact because we don't want anything to catch on the cable as we're moving it and it to unplug something or pull on a port or something like that. We then have a P-TAP to DC cable to power the EVIL 1. So I'm just going to run that into our DC port. And then same thing, I'm just going to go ahead and cable it around. Uh, we'll actually move in the other direction, help keep it a little bit more consistent. And then I can go ahead and run that into my multi-tap as well. Just going to tilt down a little bit, give me a little bit more access. And then in terms of camera build, the last piece is just the Anton Bauer 90 battery to power everything. Everything's going to go ahead and come on. And then since I'm already here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, calibrate my lens motor. So you'll notice that it's blinking green and red. And I have our Ari SXU handset here. I'm just going to hold the power button to turn it on. And these are already set to the same channel, so they'll find each other very quickly. And then it's just going to ask me if I want to calibrate. I'll hit calibrate. And it's going to go ahead and start that process, rotating to find the hard stops on our lens. And there we go, all calibrated. About a minute, doesn't take too long, it just needs to find those. And now I have full control of my, over my focus on my handset here. And then last piece for the handset at least, is just a neck strap, especially because I'm going to be operating the jib and showing you the follow focus all by myself today. I'm going to go ahead and just attach this. There's a small loop underneath, and it's going to allow me to hang that from my neck. So as I'm moving the jib, I can still keep my focus close at hand. Of course, in a full set, you're going to want to hire an AC to pull your focus and hire a jib operator. But since it's just me today, I'll show you how all that fits together. Now uh, we can go ahead and attach our camera to the jib. I know it's all the way to the ground, but I found it easiest to establish the balance for the jib with the camera attached first. So I'm just going to remove it. Everything's held together, and I'm just making sure that my plate stays clear. And I'll bring this over here and place it onto the head and let latch it in place. I'm then going to let my jib go all the way down so it's sitting comfortably. And now we can start to add weights back here to equalize the weight where it's at. Anytime I'm starting to add weights in the back, I always prefer to start with the largest weights I have. And then I'll put my lighter weights on the outside. So we'll start with two five pound. And I'm just going to run one on each side. I then have some weight clips that you'll run on each end. And I'm just going to slowly work my way through where I loosen my tilt and my stiffness. And I'm going to pick up and check and see. In an ideal world, once I've balanced it, I can let go and it would stay in any position I do. But if I still feel that that end's pulling down, I need to add more weight. And I'll just return it to where it's at and add some more weight. So let's add two more five pound. Let's see where we end up. You do want to try and make sure you equalize your weight so you're not adding 10 pounds to one side and two pounds to the other. That causes it to be a little wobbly. You want to even that weight out. So I'm adding evenly to each side as I go. We'll check. Getting a little better, but we're still pretty heavy. So I'm going to go ahead and add 10 more pounds to each side. That's two five pounds on each side.
And yeah, we are pretty close. We're still a little front heavy, so I need to add a little bit of weight back here. But we are very, very, very close. I have two 1.25 pounds, which are going to help us just add a little bit of extra weight without going too far. And we are pretty close. The last little bit of weight is going to come from a monitor that I'm going to add. And with that, it's going to finish our build, uh, our balance, I mean. And that's so that the operator of the jib can have an image to look at. Because the monitor on our camera is so far away, it would be difficult for us to run that signal back. Instead, I'm going to mount a 702 monitor on my back here. One of the really cool parts of the Kessler Pocket Jib is the weight arm back here. And because you can run weights in the center or on the side, for our purposes today, we're running them on the side, which leaves our center clear. And I can try and turn this so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So you'll notice there's a center channel here that leaves room for me to either mount additional accessories or I could put weights in there. For today, we're going to round mount a uh, piece that's typically used with the DJI Ronins, which is a rod clamp. I have a small plastic spacer, and then this clamp here, which has a quarter 20 and 3 8 mounting point, so that I can run this here, and I'll be able to mount an articulating arm for my monitor right to this adapter here. So now that we have that in place, I'm going to return this once again so that all my weight's on that center leg. I don't want to offset that weight and have my jib tip over or something like that. And then we have a Noga Cine arm that we will thread into our DJI mounting clamp. And then I've talked about this specific setup that I'm going to do a few times, but I'm purposely going to mount my monitor on the side. And I'm going to be clever about how I mount it to the top of the Noga arm so that it's going to leave me the ability to tilt the monitor without loosening the Noga arm. And that's going to allow the jib operator to easily maintain the view of what the camera is seeing even as it's moving up and down. To do that, I'm just going to start by loosening this washer on the end. And I'm just going to let it go to the end without fully tightening it down. I want it to stay loose. And then I'm going to take our monitor and begin threading it on the side. I'm going to thread it all the way down until I feel the thread get to the end of the mount, which will be right about there. And then I'm going to back out half a turn and countersink my washer into the monitor. And with that, I can now turn it, and it's still tight on my Noga arm. It's not coming loose, but I'll maintain tilt capability. And then I can position this in a way that the operator could view it and tilt it as needed to see what they're operating. I've got two LP6 batteries on the back, which will give us approximately three to four hours of runtime, and I'm just going to run a SDI cable down the arm to the monitor. I'm going to show you guys here that I have everything balanced now. So once I get it here, I can let go, and it's staying in place and not moving, which just makes running this cable a little bit easier. I can lock it in the horizontal position, and I can come up here to begin running my cable. And then I like to take the cable wrap for the cable and purposely slide that down. I'm going to use that just to help me cable the cable to ensure that I don't have excess hanging around my rig. So I'm going to drop this down. And I'm going to do one cable around my jib. And then I'll run it down to the end. 
and I'm going to pass this cable through the center of the jib, which is just going to also act to help maintain the excess cable. And then I will bring these two ends to meet and use my cable tie here to tie them together. And now if this pulls on it, it's going to pull here. And if this pulls on it, it'll also pull here as well. That gives us video down here. So now my operator can see as he's operating the jib. But I want you guys to be able to see as well. So I have our good old Flanders 21 inch monitor here. I'm going to scooch him up here so he's out of the way, but you guys can still see what we're doing. And I'm just going to run a long cable. One of the nice benefits of small HD monitors is not only do they offer signal pass through, but they also offer signal cross conversion. So if we were to run an HDMI into it, we could run an SDI out or vice versa. For our purposes today, we're just going to keep everything SDI, but we'll be able to do a nice and easy signal pass through so that you guys can see what I'm doing on the larger display. Great. Not much to see right now since we're just looking at white. And it does look like as we're building up, our camera tilted just a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and re-straighten our tripod head a little bit. And then I purposely brought a small table with a sweatshirt on it from our 10-year anniversary so that you guys can see the jib in action. So the nice thing with the macro lens is, like I said, we can get very, very close. So even with you know less than a foot of distance, I can pull my focus and still get the magnanimous logo nice and frame. Now, one of my favorite features of this build for top down is what happens next, because I can set the frame I want by vertically moving my jib to establish the exact frame that I'm looking for. So if I loosen my lock here on the side, now I can move my jib up and down. And you guys will notice in the frame that I can do some really interesting movements, zooming in, in effect, uh, with my jib. Now the jib arm itself, you'll notice it doesn't move perfectly up and down. It is going to have a slight elliptical move to it as it's going up and down. So a true straight up and down area is going to be pretty limited to about horizontal position up to about 45 degrees. But with a, the right lens and the right framing, that can be enough to add a lot of interesting effect to an image. The other thing that's really nice is that you can loosen your pan here. And I can maintain left to right movement as well. Just adding in an additional method to control how my frame lands. So I can pull out there and get the bottom in focus. And I could come in to show the top or vice versa. I know my focus pulls are not great today because I'm doing jib and focus simultaneously. But if we had a good AC with us, we'd be able to do those critical pulls a lot easier. And we can back out. You'll notice that's what I mean about my frame changing a little bit. So now the sweatshirt itself is coming out of frame as I pull back. But I can easily just lock this down. And adjust down so that you guys have a nice full view of the sweatshirt there. And this setup could be used for a bigger camera if you wanted. If you wanted to have a red or something like that, we could scale this up. Like I said, you can support up to 20 pounds fully extended. So we can scale that up as we need. Uh, or we could use a DSLR or something smaller. I've had a lot of people use these for poster prints. So they'll put like a 5DSR or an A7R4, a camera with a lot of me megapixels in there, capable of shooting higher than 6K photo resolution. Uh, the 5DSR, for instance, will do 8K RAW, and the A7R will actually do 10K RAW still images. So you can do poster prints of that and blow that up to be as large as you need to and capture every little bit of nitty gritty detail that you can. It's super useful for top down food stuff as well because my tabletop here can be uh, free on the sides and I can have someone come in, adjust food prep and things like that, and then come out and we get shots that we need there. 
And yeah, I like it because it gives you top down, but gives you a lot of movement that you don't typically get with top down. And yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite builds to do, so I'm glad we got to do it on screen. Let's check and see if you guys had any questions about this build as we were putting it together. All right, we'll go ahead and just recap all the gear that we're using. I'll stop, start on my end down here. I've got the small HD 702 monitor, which is my display down here, which is for my operator, so that as he operates the jib, I can turn the monitor and still see what I'm operating with. We've got the Flanders 21 inch over there, which is what you guys are viewing everything on. And in an ideal world, my AC would be looking at that monitor for pulling our focus and everything. The jib itself is the Kessler pocket jib, which will support up to 40 pounds closed or 20 pounds fully extended. And then at the end, we have the Panasonic EVA 1 with the Zeiss 50 millimeter macro. And we are running the Ardi SXU follow focus for focus control. And yeah, all together, a super great build that could be used for a variety of different things. So if you guys are interested in shooting top down, certainly one to check out. As always, if you have questions, comment below and we can answer those at the end of the video or comment along with you guys. And if you're looking to stream, we're streaming live from Studio One today. And you guys can stream as well. We have all the gear that you need to do it. But our partners over at PerfectCircle.pro can hook you up with not only the gear, but with an operator to set it all up for you. Take the hassle off of your back so you can focus on all the creative side, make sure it looks the way you want it to, and we'll handle the technical side to take the hassle off your back. If you guys are interested in streaming and have been intimidated by it or just need a hand, definitely check out PerfectCircle.pro. As always, guys, let me know what you want to see. I mentioned tomorrow's build is going to be a requested build from another uh, from last week. We're actually going to be looking at the Movi Pro and rigging it out for a car mount rig. It's going to be a two-part video, so tune in tomorrow, but then tune in the next day so you can see the second half of it. Tomorrow we'll be focused on how to rig out the Movi Pro with a red and all of that, so we'll be in the studio for that. I'll plan to see you guys tomorrow. Now, as always, if you have questions, just give us a call or visit magrents.com.